Okay, so uh, this is our introduction to glazing. Like I said, gang, this is going to be a lot of information for you. That's why I want you guys to think about taking some notes. I'm going to have the glaze tips sheet that's going to come up here. You don't need to print off this glaze tip sheet because there's a, not laminated, but there's a, a copy of it that's inside of the glaze area that's up on that squirrel cage. It's like basically on a little clippy that's, uh, that's uh, magnetized to that thing. So anyways, if you want to look at it outside of class, you know, while you're at home on a Saturday night, um, this is where you're going to find it in our course document area. Um, make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. Um, so this is just basically a guidelines for what it is that we're going to be doing with glazing. All right. So I'm going to go over it really quickly. I'm going to talk about some extra bits uh, that are really important about uh, our, the glazing that we do here at Chafee College. All right. Um, and then uh, we'll move into a demonstration where I'll be going, we'll be going over to the glaze area and I'm going to show you some of the glazing techniques. All right. Um, so the first thing on this sheet is, are the step-by-step -step instructions of what you should be doing when you're glazing. The number one rule is that you need to make sure that your piece is bisque fired. And the reason why we need to make sure that our piece is bisque fired is mainly because when we fire our kilns here at Chafee, we are firing them in a faster manner when we do a glaze firing than we do when we do a bisque firing. When we do a bisque firing, we sometimes do what's called a candle. When we do a candle, we keep the temperature about 180 degrees inside of the kiln. Do you guys remember why? So it doesn't expand the cracks. So cracks and pieces don't end up blowing up or falling apart in the kiln. And the reason why that we keep it low like that at 180 degrees is because it's well below 212 degrees. At 212 degrees, what happens? What's that? No, what happens to water at 212 degrees? It boils. it boils, okay? When it boils, it puts off steam. When the steam comes out of the clay, that's what causes pieces to kind of blow up in the kiln. If there's an air pocket or anything like that too, sometimes that can happen. Or that air pocket, most likely it's gonna happen when things are shrinking, okay? Or it's a little chamber where some of that, uh, the fumes from the, uh, uh, some of the fumes from the off-gassing or the, the steam coming off the, uh, out of the piece, that's what causes those explosions to happen, all right, in those air bubbles. So, number one thing is the piece has gotta be bis fired. If it is not bisque fired, it becomes a ticking time bomb inside of the kiln, and it's not gonna only ruin your piece inside of a glaze kiln, it's gonna ruin the entire like shelf that your piece is on, and sometimes even pieces that are down below it or above it, right? Because it will, if you do it in this kiln, if you leave, get an unfired or an unbisque fired piece into it, it is going to be a violent, like it will literally like explode. You know, it's not gonna make the kiln fall apart, but it's gonna go into so many teeny tiny little pieces because we, we ramp up the speed of the, of the heat so much more that it's going to be a, a pretty big problem, okay? So don't try and cut corners. Don't be like, all right, we have a critique coming up. Brian said not to do this, but I bet I can get away with it. Nobody can get away with it, right? There are other cultures that fire their pieces differently than we do, right? And when they do that, they can once fire something without this firing it first. Um, I've done a bunch of that work in Asia, in China. Uh, they fire, they once fire almost everything, all right? But that's because they're firing their kilns differently and their materials are quite a bit different, right? They react differently, they shrink differently. A lot of things are different, okay? So it's very, that is the number one rule. Please do not stray from that rule. Um, we're pretty good, all the people that load the kilns, when I pick up a piece, I can actually tell when I lift it up that it has not been bisque fired. And so if you're glazing greenware, right? Because remember, greenware is work that hasn't been bisque fired yet. It's gonna end up on that reject shelf that's right outside of the, the door, okay? So, very important. The second step is that you're gonna wipe off all the surfaces with a damp sponge. Some students say, you know what? Brian said to wipe this off with a damp sponge. I bet it'd be faster if I just turned on the faucet and just ran it under the faucet. Not a good idea. Reason why it's not a good idea is because you're gonna to introduce too much water into your piece because these pieces will absorb a bunch of water, right? If they absorb a bunch of water because you're running it under the sink, the, the faucet, 
uh, to wash it off. Basically that washing off, it's getting any sort of dust off the surface. Because sometimes any dust can actually work a little bit like a release. It won't look like it's gonna release when you have your piece and you, you dip it in and you do the glazing the correct way. But essentially what might happen is that that layer, fine layer of dust, when everything starts to shrink in the kiln, some of it might fall off, right? Because it didn't really adhere, it didn't get into the clay body of the piece. So, um, wiping all those surfaces with a damp sponge is really important. Um, something that's not mentioned on here, um, I don't think anyways, um, is that before you glaze, if you're a regular person that regularly puts lotion on your hands, wash your hands off. You don't need to use soap, but just kind of wash them off with water so you can kind of get rid of any oils off your hands or any lotion that you might have on your hands, okay? Because those things can actually work as releases when we're touching our work too, before we glaze it, all right? Um, and so basically if you get too much water in your piece from wiping it off or from running it under the faucet actually, um, when you dip it into the, into the glaze and pull it out, it might take a very long time for your piece to dry out, right? And if it takes all that much time for it to dry out, you're sitting here waiting for sometimes two, three hours because there's nowhere for the water from the glaze to go in. When we go in there and I give you the demonstration, you guys are gonna see that when you dip it in and pull it out, within a matter of like 10 seconds or less, the piece is dry to the touch, right? Because all the water from the glaze just goes and sucks into that bisque, the, the bisque fired piece, yes. So all pieces have to be bone dry before we glaze them, correct? Bisque fired. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Not bone dry, bone yeah, dry yeah. would be greenware. Yeah, my bad, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, so, um, but when you wipe it off, you'll see it when I give you the demonstration over there, when you wipe it off, it's just a quick wipe off just to get any sort of dust that might be on the, on the piece. Because okay. they sit outside, right? Mm -hmm. And if they sit outside on those shelves, there's dust and stuff that flies around all over the place, right? So you just want to make sure that you don't have that stuff on your pieces. All right, um, so glazes are water soluble and they tend to thicken day by day, right? As students open up the trash can lids or the bucket lids and they dip their pieces in there that suck up all that moisture or if they sit out in the air, the water's gonna come off of them, right? It's gonna evaporate essentially and they thicken day by day. So um, if you apply a glaze too thickly, sometimes it'll run off the piece in the firing right and sometimes it'll form little cracks all over the surface of your piece and if you got a bunch of little cracks all over your piece and it's not our crackle glaze because that one does it no matter what um, then that's that glaze might actually fall off in the firing as well so a piece too uh, if their glaze is on there too thickly it's going to run down and it's going to run onto the shelf and you're going to have unsightly glaze dripped off the bottom of your piece and then you're going to have to grind all that and it's going to be a pain to grind it and it's not going to look as good all right so we wanna make sure that we don't apply it too thickly. And then a, a glaze applies too, too thinly, most of them come out some sort of a shade of brown if they're, uh, too, if they're applied too uh, thin, all right? If you dip your piece in and you pull it out and you can actually see through the glaze and see your clay body color, then that means you dipped it too thinly, right? And typically that happens when students don't mix the glazes because the glazes have a bunch of different materials inside of there they all, all have different atomic weights, and as, you, as they sit over there, like right now, if I went to any one of the glazes that are over there, because nobody's used them in a little bit, and I went to go dip them in there, there's gonna be a microscopic little level of water on the top, and if I dip it straight in there, it's gonna absorb a bunch of water in it first, and then the glaze, and then I'm gonna get a thinly applied glaze, right? So it won't have the right consistency, and so that's why it's really important that we stir, okay? so. Um, stirring the glaze. That's actually not something that's on here as a step per se, but we always have to mix our glaze first before we start. You'll see me do it when we get over there. All right? Um, so then we're going to dip the piece into the glaze, <clears throat> count to one, and then we pull it out. <coughs> and when I pull my pieces out, I leave them upside down like this, and I kind of shake it a little bit like this over the trash can. Or, or trash can that the glaze came out of, not the trash can, right? Or I do this over the bucket that I just dipped it. I'm allowing some of the stuff that's there that's kind of liquid to drip off, all right? The other thing that I'm doing when I do this is I'm allowing, if there's any movement of the glaze, it's moving towards the top of the piece. A big common thing that beginning students do is that they dip it into the glaze, they pull it out, and then they immediately turn it right side up and put it onto the table. 
And when you do that, if there's any liquid glaze that's still there, it's moving down this way and it's moving closer to the bottom of the piece. If it moves closer to the bottom of the piece, then you're gonna have more glaze down here at the bottom and less glaze up here at the top. It's better to have more at the top than the bottom because then you have room for it to run, okay? Some of the glazes we have run more than others. So we have test tiles that we can look at. These, this is what our test tiles look like. I'm gonna talk about these in a second. All right, test tiles look like that. Um, and there are two test tiles for every glaze. We'll get to that in a moment, all right? But when you look at your test tile, if you look at this glaze, which is called um, Celsa Oribe, you can see right here that there's a, a thickness to the glaze right here. What does that look like, that thickness? What's that? Yeah, but what is like shape-wise? What? Is, why it's, is it? It's dripping. It's dripping, right? That's what's happening with this glaze. This glaze is runny, right? Sometimes it runs so much that you'll see the drips going down that way, right? Down below this section. But when we do these test tiles, we dip these test tiles. Uh, these are made by us, either myself or, or Michael or um, one of the student techs, all right? What we do is we take it upside down and we dip it one time into glaze and we let it do this and we set it right side up, let it dry all the way. And then we dip it a second time right to the halfway mark, right? So this was dipped to the halfway mark and that glaze that was dipped twice thickly, right? Cause this is thicker up here than it is down here has run down in to that first layer, right? So that tells me that this glaze is a runny glaze. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So, uh, da -da 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 -da. if your glaze surface cracks upon drying, you've applied it too heavily. In this case, wash it completely using like a scrubber to get it out of all the nooks and crannies. <coughs> and then set it aside, put it outside again, wait a day and then come back to glaze it because it, at that point it will have absorbed too much water and it won't be able to get glazed, okay? Everybody with me, with me so far? All right, uh, da, 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 da. if you can see the surface of your pot through the glaze, you've applied it too thinly, wait until it dries, dip it again. Most likely you didn't stir it or it was a little bit too long since you stirred it, so give it a little stir right before you do it, okay? Um, then, the seventh step here is that you can touch up, or sorry, brush, squirt, pour, spray, some other method that you can potentially fathom in your brain. You know, don't put the glaze in your mouth and then spit it onto the piece because glazes have heavy metals in them, right? Like iron, manganese, copper. This is stuff that you don't want to get in your mouth, okay? It's stuff you want to try and avoid getting on your skin, right? because heavy metals can be absorbed through your skin, all right? It's okay if you get a little bit on your hand or on your arm because it's a drip or a splash, but then you wanna take it off as soon as you can, just with a sponge. It's not gonna hurt anything, okay? The way that I was taught, and this wasn't even that long ago, is that I was taught by my instructor to put my hand down into the glaze bucket and stir the glaze bucket around with my hand. That was the old school way to do things, right? We don't really do that anymore because over time, this is a lot like that silicosis thing we talked about, about breathing clay dust. You're not gonna get heavy metal poisoning this semester, right? Unless you hang out in a vat of glaze for, you know, like the whole semester, right? Um, and I don't even know then, that might not be enough. It's, a, it's over a lifetime, right? There was a, a man by the name of David Chainer and he used really heavy iron and manganese glazes and he actually died from heavy metal poisoning. Um, or at least they think that's what, like, he got cancer essentially from heavy metals, right? So they're potentially dangerous, but if they're used properly, the glazes, then we'll be good to go, okay? So just follow it, what it is that I talked to you guys about. So you can dip a second glaze onto a piece, but I wouldn't go more than like a third or maybe a half at the most, right? Half and half sometimes doesn't look all that good, right? So two thirds, one third looks a little bit better. That's the golden rule, right? When we're do using photography, if you're looking at that horizon line, you wanna get your horizon line either on the top third or the bottom third. You don't want it right smack dab in the middle. It looks a little bit too mundane in that sense. You wanna have one portion of your photograph to um, essentially be a little bit more um, overwhelming. So you want your landscape to be more overwhelming than the sky or the sky more overwhelming than the land. 
and then you can tell your viewer essentially when you do these things where it is that you want to look. You know, if you're looking at a portrait of a lake with the sky and that you want to show the lake and all the loons on the lake or something like that, then you're going to do two thirds of that photograph of the lake and only one third of the sky. But if you have a big flying V formation of geese that's flying over the lake, then you might want to change that and have one third of the lake and two thirds of the sky. So something to think about when we're thinking about our composition of how we're applying our glazes. Does that make sense, gang? Okay. Um, then when we're finished, like I said, some of this stuff doesn't make sense when we talk about it, but it will when I show you. Uh, when we're finished with all that, touch up any blemishes or finger marks when the pot is dry, not when your pot is wet. If it still has liquid glaze on it and it's still in the phase of dry, don't try and get in there and manipulate. Wait till it gets dry. You can dip your finger into the glaze and just doop, doop, give it a little touch. And then you can kind of, whatever that spot is that didn't get glazed, you can get that portion glazed very easily that way. I'll show you how to do it. All right, then decorating can be done with oxides, which I'll show you when we get over there. They're basically heavy, almost straight up heavy metals, powdered heavy metals like iron, manganese. Um, our, our black stain is actually a, a combination of a bunch of different uh, colors or a bunch of different heavy metals um, and uh, rutile. So we've got four of them that are over there, all right? Um, doo -doo 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 -doo, let's see. Then our last but finally not least um, step is that we are going to wipe the bottom of our pot, all right? Because if we have glaze on the bottom of the piece and we put it out there to get it fired, number one, it will never end up in a kiln. It'll end up on the um, rejection shelf, okay, the reject shelf. But more importantly, think about it, all right? When glaze goes into the kiln and it goes up to the temperatures that we're firing at, which is about 2260 some odd degrees, right? When it goes to that level, the glaze itself becomes like molten lava, like molten glass. If you've ever seen people glass blowing and they pull the glass out of that big furnace and it's like dripping, right? That's what this stuff does when it's in the kiln, it becomes sticky. So if you have glaze on the bottom of it, your piece will stick to the kiln shelf, uh, right? And then, we'll like and then when, you it. when it take, when it comes off, it's gonna have a bunch of white junk on the bottom of it. That white junk is stuff that we call kiln wash, right? The kiln wash is a light wash that we put on the shelves that protects our shelves. So that if you forget to wipe the bottom or if there's any glaze drips that happen, it sticks to the kiln wash. And when we put, pick the pot up, the kiln wash comes off with it and our shelf is okay. Right? Because if it wasn't there, the shelf could actually absorb the glaze and it would fuse to the shelf. And then the shelf itself would almost be ruined. Okay? But we have super fancy shelves here, so that actually never would happen here at Chafee. Uh, although we do have some electric kiln shelves that are still that style. Um, but we've kind of upgraded here at Chafee to a top of the line, technologically advanced kiln shelf called Advancers. They're fancy and they're expensive. All right? So, just as a general guideline, right here, this is about our temperatures that we fire to, okay? So we've got our bisque firing at 1,859 degrees at 06, and our uh, glaze firing at cone 6, which is 2,246 degrees. Now, do you guys remember when we talked about cones before? Does anybody remember? Is a temperature what we're looking for? Because it's not like, how many of you guys have made brownies before? And you put your brownie, uh, your brownies into the preheated oven at like 425, 450 degrees, something like that, right? And it says, oh, if you're in a nine by 14 pan, then you wanna put it in there for X amount of time. And then you do that and it gets to X amount of time and you go and you check and they're not done yet, right? But you did exactly what the box said, right? Well, sometimes it's not all about how much how much temperature you have within there and the time, it's the time and the temperature together. Maybe your oven is not calibrated properly and if, if it says 425 degrees, maybe it's actually at 417, so you have to leave it in there a little longer. It's a little different with a kiln. The kilns, a lot of it has to do with the end of the firing, the end portion of the firing. If you come up in temperature, and this is not important for you guys to write down, but just for you to understand how cones work, because cones are about melt. They're not about getting to a certain temperature. And materials don't always melt at the exact same temperature. It all depends 
on how fast that kiln goes up from the last like 300 degrees to the last 100 degrees essentially of that, uh, of that kiln firing. So a cone, this number that's here, the cone six or cone 06, those are not temperatures. That's why we call them cones because we put this little device in there that looks like this and that cone essentially starts to melt when it gets to the melt portion, cone six. Materials that are designed to melt at cone six will melt if you see your cone six cone do this and touch the shelf, okay? That's not always gonna be at 2246 degrees. Sometimes it's gonna be higher, sometimes it's gonna be lower. It all depends on that time variable. If we went up too fast at the end of the firing or we went up slowly at the end of the firing, that will change this degree Fahrenheit number. Okay, not important for you to know exactly how it works at this point, unless you decide that you wanna go on and you know, get your uh, bachelor's or your master's in ceramics. Then you start to learn a little bit more about it as you learn how to fire kilns, okay? So that's just to let you know, that's why we use these terms, cone 06 and cone six. That's not why when you, tell, when you hear me about it, it's like, oh, make sure you put it on the 2246 degree shelf, all right? A lot easier to say cone six, okay? All right, so any questions so far, gang? Yes? What would happen if you, uh, what if you put those in the kiln again? Um, if I put these in the kiln again, they might move a little bit more. Will they change color? They won't necessarily change color, no. We'll talk about these two sets here in just a moment, though, all right? Okay, do, 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 do. final tips. Always record your work and how you glazed it in your notebook. This is one of the things that I'm gonna be looking at at your midterm and your final. And that's in your notebook, you guys are gonna draw pictures of your objects. So you're gonna have, and you're gonna do two pieces on each page, no more. If you wanna do one, that's fine, right? But don't have a page that's this big, you know, your eight and a half by 11 or whatever, and then draw your little pot right here, right? because it's a whole big waste of space right here, right? So two mats, so we can put a line through this, and if I have a pinch pot, I'm gonna draw my pinch pot with my little foot on it, okay? And mine has a bunch of little dimples in it, right? So I can put this little thing here, so that way I know which little pinch pot it is, right? Genesis, I think you're the one that made like the little kind of scalloped edge a little bit on yours, so you would kind of draw however it is that you think you can draw it, right? This is not a drawing class. You're not graded on how you draw your objects, okay? But it's important that you draw objects. It's important that you draw something and you can tell which one it is. And then when we glaze it, we're gonna be putting a little line here and we're gonna see, oh, I glazed this one with Seltzer or eBay. For spelling, and for the names of the glazes, it's all on those buckets over there. Use our eyes. Take a look at it. It's part of your, the knowledge that you need to have for this class to be able to know what these glazes are called and how they're spelled. There's not going to be a test on how they're spelled or anything, but it's right there on the bucket, gang. Right? It doesn't take a lot for you guys to look at that bucket and see what that glaze is called. All right? So if I just glaze this one color, this would be my road map to what my object would look like. Does that make sense? Okay. Then I've got that square shaped um, kind of piece. It has the stamps on it, right? Little stamps that go all the way down. Bam, something like that. And it has a little edge that's on here. Now I'm making it look like a shirt collar or something. You know, however you want to do it. And it has the same kind of thing down here, right? With little lines, okay? So now I can tell that that's that slab piece that I created, okay? And then let's say for some reason, I decided I want to change it up a little bit and I have a glaze down here and I'm just for ease of, of calling it, I'm just gonna uh, use some glaze colors that are over there. Um, so we have one called toilet bowl white because it's white like a toilet bowl, okay? And maybe I put like a little like drippy kind of thing of glaze that was up here that I did maybe the 
licorice. Okay? And then there's kind of, when you dip one glaze over top of another glaze, a lot of times there's like an overlap, right, that happens. So I could put a, a third little line here and say because I dip toilet bowl white first and then licorice, I'm going to say that this little section right here is licorice over toilet bowl white. Because licorice over toilet bowl white looks different than toilet bowl white over licorice. And the reason why I want you guys to have these roadmaps is not for me. It's for you. Okay? For you, because if you get a, a result that you really like and you want to recreate it and you didn't write it down, guess what you're going to do? That's going to suck. You're going to mess up. No, you're going to come to me and you're going to say, hey, Brian, did I put licorice here over white or did I put white over licorice? And if I've never used those two colors together, which I haven't actually, I may not know, right? So it's for your own knowledge for you guys to understand what happens when certain glazes go over top of other glazes versus the other way around. So if we don't keep a record of that, it's not going to help us out in the long run. So when you go over to glaze your objects, you're going to have your notebook with you, right? Or something with you to take some notes, right? So that then you can transcribe them like this into your sketchbook. Sound good? Okay. And then there's other things that you might add on there, like maybe you took glaze and you dipped your fingers in it and you went like this onto your piece. So you're going to say that. You're going to say, I dip my fingers. You know, maybe you write a little note down here, right? Saying how you did something. I dip my fingers into toilet bowl white and I sprinkled it on, right? Because then you'll remember, right? It's really helpful, gang. I'm serious, okay? And I want to see these things in your notebook and I want to see them taking up the page, all right? I can't tell you how often I get students that do this and they have a big piece and they're like, Ryan said I only do two. So, all right, I'm going to make my pinch pot like this and then I'm going to do this, that, the other. And then I'm going to put another one right here. This is my cylinder that I made for the supported form. And, do, do, do. and then there's all this. Like, it doesn't help us, right? The more we use our hands and draw, the more we're exercising our drawing hand, right? We're going to get better at drawing. Um, just like if you want to get better at hiking, you got to go hiking. And you got to move your legs and you got to get your move your feet and then you're going to be able to hike longer and you're going to be able to, you know, not huff and puff quite as much when you go hiking, right? Or if you're a swimmer or if you're a mountain biker or if you're a whatever, right? Even if you're a reader, you open up that book and you start reading. If you read a lot of books, you're fast at reading. If you just read a book every six months, you're probably not as quick and your retention's not as good, okay? Because you're not exercising that part of your brain. Anytime that we want to learn how to do something and we want to get good at it, we exercise that part of our brain. Exact same reason why I have you guys rolling out coils to make a larger piece. So you're not making two coils or four coils, you're making six or eight or 10 or 12. You're getting better at making coils when you do that. Does that make sense? Okay. Some of this stuff is muscle memory that we're learning how to do. Like you guys should come up here and look at Armando's coils. Like his coils are beautiful. They're all like perfectly made. You know, I would probably say next time, put a little water on there when you, before you do it because you're getting a little bit of cracking. But other than that, they're perfect. I mean, they are like literally, they look like they came out of the, the um, extruder over there. Like they're good. Did you extrude them? Probably the only part of I know. I'm just kidding. I'm good at, so. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's basically our. Uh, oh, st sorry. Try to achieve an even coat of glaze. Glazes can be overlapped, no more than two coats, to get different results. If we're glazing the inside and the outside different colors, or if we have a larger object, we want to glaze the inside first and then the outside. Just makes it easier on the on the dipping. Okay. Um, Never hold anything by its handle or any little thing that you've added on there, a little nub, a little, you know, like Frankenstein little bolts or something like that. Like, you don't want to hold on to those when you're glazing them, okay? Because remember, when it's only been bisfired, it's not at the maturity of the clay body quite yet. So those pieces could fall off, especially if you have a cup with a handle and you're dipping it in, and then you get all that extra weight of, of glaze inside of that object right it's gonna be lost now it's going to it might pop off 
and then your piece falls to the bottom of the bucket and you're like, ah, right? You go crazy. Um, we can recover from that, so don't worry. If you drop your piece into a bucket, it's recoverable, right? Um, do not spill or pour one glaze into another glaze bucket. That's important because we don't want to cross contaminate. If we're using the blue glaze, um, cobalt blue, I don't want to accidentally dump the cobalt blue if I you know, pour it inside of one of my pieces. I don't want to accidentally pour it out into the toilet bowl white because then white is not white anymore, right? Um, cobalt is the most powerful colorant in ceramics, so even just you know, five or six drips into that toilet bowl white container and the toilet bowl white is no longer going to be bright white, it's going to be more of a blue white. Okay, white. it's really, really strong stuff. Okay, um, when choosing glazes to use together, think about complementary colors, things that kind of oppose each other, or think about monochromatic, right? Two different blue colors, um, or maybe tones that go together. Like if you're using warm colors, maybe use a warm color and a cool color to complement, or you can use a warm color and a warm color to make it look more monotone. Okay. Just think about colors that go together. Don't try and uh, you know, choose two colors that don't really mesh together, right? That's called color discord, right? Color discord is something like pink and orange, right? Pink and orange don't look good together. But sometimes in our fashion, in the days of fashion that's happening right now, those colors sometimes show up together on shirts. And there's a reason why they do that. The reason why they do that is because it's so crazy to see that you can't stop looking at it because there's something so wrong about it, right? You're like, why do I still want to keep looking at that? It like intrigues you, but they're using it as a way to try and get you to, to look, right? These are all different, and same, same thing goes for complementary colors. Colors like blue and orange. Red and green. They're across Purple from yellow. one another on the color wheel. They look good together, right? It's my favorite colors together too, and I don't even like care about football. Right? I don't care about the Broncos or uh, what is this other team that's blue and orange. Yeah, maybe, right? That doesn't, that's not what I care about, right? I just like those two colors together for whatever reason. But then you have orange, or sorry, I'm sorry, um, you have yellow and purple. Those are across from one another on the color wheel. That's what, me that's what it means when they say complementary colors. You guys ever seen a color wheel before? Those color wheels are there, and the ones from one here to there, that's a complementary color directly across from one another, right? If they're near each other, right, it's different. Then you have like those complementary colors, like red and green, is, those are complementary colors as well, but what do you think of when you see red and green together? Christmas. Christmas, it's almost impossible to get away from thinking about Christmas when you see green and, um, and uh, 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 red. red together now, unless it's like summertime and then you might think of like a watermelon right so there are certain certain times where it might be appropriate to use those two colors together but just think about your color combinations when you do that plus the colors that we have here are more natural colors so even if you use a red and a you know, like this is basically like what we consider red in the firing range that we're going to okay unless you're using um, the uh, slips because the slips will give you more of a vibrant red, okay? This is a red. These two glazes right here, do you think these are the same glaze or a different glaze? Same glaze. What's that? Same. Different. So some people think same, some people think different. If I didn't like pose that question, you just saw them walking by them, you probably would look at them and say, those are different glazes, mm -hmm. right? The only difference is this is Seltzer Arebe, this is Seltzer Arebe. Right? This has been fired in what's called reduction environment, where the amount of oxygen is reduced in the environment to the kiln, and it causes the copper to change color. It takes the oxygen molecules away from the copper, and it, and it turns the copper. If you take all the oxygen molecules out of it, it's gonna make shiny copper like a penny, right? Or what we think of as a penny, because our pennies these days are not even made of copper, right? This is copper oxide having oxygen connected to it, right? So copper oxide is gonna be green. Just like if you've ever looked at copper pipes that have been sitting outside for a long period of time, of or if you think of the Statue of Liberty, 
The Statue of Liberty should be shiny like a penny. That's probably how the Statue of Liberty was delivered to the United States. But who knows? I don't know. No, they had black and white photos in the day, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was But they copper. also could have patinaed the outside of it to make it turn green before. But if you use copper to create something, cop the metal copper, it is going to be more of the reddish coppery color like this. But then over time, it turns green, okay? Because oxygen connects to it again, and it changes the color of it, just so, like those copper pipes. So does that mean that over time, like a long, long no. time, that'll eventually... No, because okay. these are sealed systems. Oh, okay. This is this, because it's been... Take it to temperature, it's like, this is glass now. So that's stuff. This will it. never change. Oh, okay. Never, ever, ever right. change, All right? Oh, well, in like 10,000 years, it will reconstitute itself back into the earth if you let it sit in one place for long enough. Wait, so if we did want the green, we have to place it on which self? So self that's self. a great question, Rita, good question. So this is, if we want the green for this specific glaze, this one, because it tells you on here, it says Celsius Rebe, and it says OX which means oxidation, right? So our oxidation kilns are the electric kilns that are over there, the ones where we take our bisque fire stuff, all right? So if you want things to be fired in oxidation, you take them over there, but you don't put them on the O6 shelves, you put them on the cone six oxidation glaze shelves. So if we wanted our piece to have like, what if I wanted that piece, uh, that green like on the bottom of Oh, you would have to use two different glazes, which could work because we have another one over there that's called um, Suave Mauve slash, what's the green part called? Hint of Mint, all right? Hint of Mint is the opposite. Hint of Mint will be green in reduction and Hint of Mint will be more of a mauve color when it's fired in oxidation. And the reason why is because it's chrome and tin together in the glaze, which reverses that whole thing. There's no iron, or sorry, there's no copper involved. This is a copper glaze. Copper in oxidation is green. Copper in reduction, various forms of red. It's not always gonna come out like this. It's, there's an atmosphere in the kiln. And depending on where your piece is placed, you're gonna either have more reds, less reds, maybe even some greens. If you look at this carefully where it's thick, you can see a feathering of green that's up here, all right? So, this glaze, same glaze. This glaze is called Chino, all right? This one is our carbon trap Chino. This is one glaze. The one glaze creates the orange, creates the tan, creates the kind of blackish, smoky gray color. It can even come out much blacker than that, all right? So, one glaze can create a whole bunch of different colors depending on what, what you're looking to do. Okay, so look at your test tiles and look at them closely. Does that make sense, gang? All right. Um, this glaze, I, some people might find this attractive. I don't personally, because I personally I feel like it just looks like the, it, it looks like taupe or something, like the color that my mom used to like to paint her walls in her house. Right. So it's like I'm kind of off put by this color, but. Maybe you might find a, 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 a reason to use it. I don't know. Maybe you put some other glaze over top of it and then when it comes out, it looks magical. I don't know. But Chino, I can tell you from long years of experience, any Chinos, Chinos never went to um, kindergarten. So they didn't learn how to play well with others, right? Because that's kind of what you live in, learn in kindergarten, preschool, right? How can we interact with other human beings in this group setting while we're learning about things? So later on, when we get into first, second, third grade, we can start learning about harder things, right? So this glaze never went to, to those grades, so it doesn't really like to play with other glazes. If you try and take like a Celso Arribe and dip this in um, Chino and then dip it in Celso Arribe afterwards and put Celso Arribe over top of it, probably gonna be more successful than if you took Celso Arribe and dipped Chino on top of it. Chino really doesn't work on top of other glazes, but some glazes will go on top of it and be okay, but you're kind of testing the waters if you go into that realm, because I can't tell you which ones work, because I like Chino by itself. I dip something in Chino because I like the appearance of Chino, right? And most of the historical pieces, it's a Jap historically Japanese glaze, and 
Most of the Shinos that are produced are produced so that they can be fired in a kiln by themselves with Shino, and that's it, right? And it's that magic that happens while they're inside of that kiln atmosphere that creates that range of color that kind of is like a little bit romantic, right? We put this object in and we're like, I know it's gonna come out Shino, but I don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, and I'm gonna make let the magic of the kiln do its thing, and then I'm either, either gonna love it or hate it when it comes out of the kiln, right? There's ways to manipulate Shinos. There's people that have spent their entire careers working in Shinos. Malcolm Davis is somebody to look up if you're interested in Shinos. Um, he's passed away now, but nearly, we're not one of these studios, but nearly every studio I've worked in has a bucket of Malcolm Davis Shino glaze. He has like a world famous Shino glaze that he created um, that is absolutely gorgeous, right? We also don't fire to cone 10 here, which is why we don't have Malcolm Davis's Shino, right? We used to, but we don't any longer. So that's probably why we don't have it here. But um, he basically dedicated his career to working in Shinos, right? Different Shinos and putting different Shinos. Shinos work with Shinos because they all have the same basic ingredients, just different proportions. So just something to think about, okay? Um, if you want to put something over top of Shino, be careful right? Smaller amounts and maybe do a test tile first. Take a piece that you don't want that you're not going to get a grade on, right? That doesn't matter and try it out first before you put it on the object you're thinking about doing it on, okay? We did have a student one semester who's now out at um, Cal State Fullerton that did that. He was working primarily in chinos and he was trying different uh, glazes that we used and putting them over top of and underneath to try and see what kind of surfaces he could come up with. Most of what his, most of his work um, was more sculptural and some of it was pottery, but he was doing like really narrow neck bottles so he could, and then he would put, it wasn't anything you would actually put anything in, it's just there for an aesthetic to look at, right? Um, and so some of it cracked really, you know, heavily and, and made a really nice surface. And some of it cracked so heavily that it had really sharp bits that were coming off of it and it looked almost scary, right? Scary to touch, scary to look at, right? So it just all depends. Now, the other quality of glaze that I want to talk about is transparent glaze, which is this. You can see through this glaze, it's like looking through glass, right? And I can see the, um, the clay body that's underneath it. This Shino, is it transparent? Does it look transparent from where you're sitting? No. No, this is opaque, right? You don't get to see the clay body. So remember we talked about your slipped pieces, Any, anybody who's the cover, colored slips to paint their object? If you did that, you probably want to look for transparent glazes where you can see through that glaze. Clear is our most transparent, right? It's crystal clear. It's like looking through one pane of clear glass. This is like looking through a pane of glass that's colored green. So if I had colored slips on something, I could still see the colored slip, but red is not gonna be vibrant red when you're looking through a layer of green. It's only gonna be vibrant red if you look at a layer, or look through a layer of crystal clear, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, we have a glaze that's over there also that's called um, Celadon. Celadon is a pale green color. That one, you end up getting pretty good, you know, uh, vibrant colors of those colored slips, right? So it's not too bad to use one of the, like a celadon um, to dip over uh, your slips as well. But you want to think about more lighter transparent glazes like the clear or the celadon. Darker ones, so if you put like black, for example, um, if you put black slip on something, black is going to be black no matter what color glass you're looking for. Right? Okay? Everybody with me? Any questions? All right. So, last little bit here. Remember these terms. Glaze. Glaze is a glassy or vitreous uh, coating um, whose primary purposes are decoration, strength, and protection, meaning sanitation. Those are the three things that glaze does, right? Glaze gives us an aesthetic so we know what it looks like, right? Um, gives us that color, that decoration. It gives it strength because it puts a shell of glass around that bisque fired piece, okay? 
that clay. When it goes in there, right, when you fire gla uh, the glaze firing, there's actually a layer of um, fusion that happens between the glaze and the clay. And that's because in glazes, we don't just put silica, which is our glassing agent, we put colors in there to make it look the color, the heavy metals to color it the way we want it to be colored. Then what we also put in there is we put in clay. There's actually clay in glazes. And that's because you need to have that silica component, all right? So that, that way you can get it to melt, those things to melt together and create a fusion layer. So it's actually connected to your piece. It's not like spray painting. You know, when you spray paint, you have to rough up the surface first and then you paint your spray on there. And if you didn't rough up your surface, the paint won't stick on all that well. This is not sticking on. This is actually becoming one with that layer or becoming one with that clay, okay? It won't just shiver off. It won't fall off. Right? Unless for some reason there's a fit issue, but we test all of our glazes. Um, vitreous, we just use that in the definition for glaze, and vitreous means that it has a shiny, non-porous surface. Non-porous means what? What's that? No, not, it doesn't have to do with air. What's the difference between a porous surface and a non-porous surface? absorbs water okay so if it's non-porous that means it's not going to absorb water so clay fired up if it's a vitreous clay body it is going to not absorb water our bisque fired pieces absorb water once that clay becomes vitreous then it won't absorb water any longer so our cone six clays they have maybe about one percent water absorption which is really minor okay very, very little. It's like very similar to like a rock, okay? Um, clay, a heavy, damp, plastic material that sets upon drying and can be changed by heat into a hard waterproof material, right? Greenware, clay that is unfired. It can be wet or dry and still be considered greenware, right? Even when we're working on our objects, that's still considered greenware. At wet, at Leather hard, at cheese hard, at bone dry, right? That's all greenware, okay? The difference is, is that you don't call your bag of clay greenware, right? Because you haven't yet made it into an object, right? So, leather hard, or sorry, cheese hard, we know that one. Soft, slightly flexible, stage right before leather hard, can connect handles and other attachments at this level. Uh, leather hard is hard, not as flexible or not flexible at all. Uh, last stage that you can use to connect those handles or other pieces to it, right? Uh, slip, clay particles that are suspended in water, has a yogurt consistency, can yield brighter colors than what our cone six palette can, can give us. You know, like our bright reds, our bright yellows, our bright oranges, things like that. Um, you can also use con construction slip, or in this table sense, you can use colored slip to connect your objects together, right? Um, and then bone dry clay that is very hard. The color lightens, all right? It's too late to put any connections or any attachments on at that point in time, and it's very fragile. It's when the clay is in the most fragile state. And like a few of you guys can attest to, it's very important that you very carefully lift up those objects with two hands to take them out to get them fired, okay? Any questions? Yes. Genesis. So when I do my artist journals and I look for um, pieces, um, some artists, they have like painted designs. Yes. Is that glaze or is that? That can be a number of different things, all right? Because what we're learning here in this class is more on the simple side of things. You know, how to dip glazes to have things happen. Um, there's materials that are called underglazes. They can be put on, uh, some underglazes can be put on greenware or on bisqueware, okay? And underglazes act more like a slip right, but are more liquidy than a slip would be that's not quite as thick, right, it's a little bit more liquidy, and you can actually paint them on the surface in different ways. Um, we don't have those here available for you, but if you want to buy them, you can buy them. You can go to a ceramic supplier and buy them. And then you would want to use a transparent uh, glaze over top of that to be able to allow those colors to shine, to shine through and to see through, okay? Um, the other thing is 
there are low temperature glazes that you can actually paint on in a painterly fashion. The glazes that we formulate here are dip on glazes. If you try and, there's so much water in our glazes here that if you try to dip it in, uh, brush into it and then paint it on your bisque ware, as soon as you touch the brush to the surface, it would dry out, okay? So you're not gonna, you're not, you don't get that painterly feel of like allowing that thing to, the brush to move, glide sl uh, slowly across the surface and give you that aesthetic. Okay, or give you that brushing look, right? It's very difficult to brush on these glazes. I've seen people try it, and most of the time, it doesn't come out looking like what it should, which is the dipping portion, okay? The dipping style. Um, yes, Echo. Um, no, that would be more glass, but there are certain porcelains that they call translucent porcelains, where if you were to hold a piece, like I have some pieces I made in China, that if I hold it up to the light like this, and I put my hand like this, I would be able to see the shadow, but I wouldn't be able to see the creases in my fingers. I would just be able to see that light is passing through that material, but you're only gonna see a shadow, right? You're gonna see that, there, that there's darkness there, okay? Um, so, um, then there's other things too. China paints, which is an overglaze that you do after you glaze, um, some of my pieces on my website that have that really, um, those like pipes that are on there, uh, that's actually a decal, and that decal is China paints, so it's a third firing that I put those pieces through after I have done the bisque firing, done the glaze firing with the glaze on it, and then I apply the, the decal to the um, finished piece and then put it back into a kiln at a very, very low temperature. Right, so you can multiple fire things to do that kind of stuff. And there's a huge range of color that you can achieve with China paints, right? Um, and the reason why they're called China paints is because they were basically invented in China, and China still uses them very much in their uh, historical, they're in their historical record from even, I don't know, probably 2,000, 2,500 years ago, or maybe even more. Um, all the way up until now, they still use them over there um, in their traditional uh, pieces. Um, and then there's also an Italian technique which is called Mialica. It sounds like a funny word, it's even spelled dip, uh, even more funny. Um, and um, Mialica is basically a tin-based glaze, if I remember right, um, and it's white. And typically it's put over terracotta style clay or that more red clay. And then you use um, colorants to paint over top of it. And it has more of a, um, it looks a little bit more like uh, uh, watercolor, right? Unless you get really heavy um, color in there. But you can, you can make different, get painterly styles painting over top of that white glaze with that Mialica style, right? Lots of different things. At one point in time, and hopefully in the future, we'll be offering that as a Chafee again. We used to have a firing techniques class. And in that firing techniques class, we basically explore a lot of different things that we do other than the cone six oxidation and reduction. That's basically what's available to you guys here, right? Cone six oxidation reduction. And if you want to, if you want to buy commercial cone 06 glazes, you can actually purchase those at a ceramic supplier and you can paint them onto the surface of your piece if you want to have something that's really like, you know, vibrant colors or something that you maybe, many of you guys probably did that style of glazing in high school. Uh, where you could have whites and purples and greens and blues and blacks and things like that. And you could have them right next to each other and they don't really run into each other, right? Um, those are achievable using low fire commercial glazes that can be purchased. And typically all of those cone, uh, all of those are cone 06. They don't go up to cone six. Cone six, you run into a different palette of color, a more natural palette of color using heavy metals as colorants, all right? Any other questions? See what I said? It's a lot of information, right? I mean, we, I could talk about glaze for days. I've actually taught that firing techniques class before, and it's an entire semester, right, of learning about different firing techniques and how can we achieve different things within the field of ceramics. So there's a lot of stuff to be gone. <laughs>